ladies and gentlemen welcome back to my channel and welcome back into another video today's video i have a very very special video and before i before i get into it and introduce you to my host today to my guest i should say i just want to say one of the reasons why i have her on today is because uh, I was going through my Instagram and I follow a page called what is it the chronic love the chronic love love club love club yeah and your story <clears throat> touched me so much that today you know I wanted you to come to my to my YouTube channel and just kind of bring more light into your issue bring more awareness into the issue. And I just, I was just so amazed how strong you were that you gave me strength. I even told you at one point that like, I was that night that I read your, your, um, your update on what was going on with your life. I was just like, I needed that in my life because it just gave me a lot of hope and how positive you are. was amazing. So today guys, please help me introduce Miranda to our channel. Uh, and we're going to get into a lot of things, but welcome, Miranda. Welcome to my channel. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm so excited to talk to you today and just get into a lot of things. So Miranda has been suffering from uh, pulmonary fibrosis for a very long time now. And I wanted to have her on here so we can talk about her experience, how it's been like, uh, even to the point where, you know, at this point, if I'm, if I'm correct, you are trying to have lung transplants correct yeah i am and currently uh sorry i'm currently on the transition of getting on that list correct and you know we're gonna get into all that her lifestyle her how everything started and just again try to bring as much light and awareness as we can uh to many people out there suffering as many of you guys know i have suffered from many health issues for about a decade now uh, you know, from GERD, uh, uh, heart issues. I've had surgeries for my GERD that have unfortunately failed. And then I've had a <coughs> catheter ablation for my heart. And I'm still unfortunately suffering from a health issue. So this right here is just, you know, something beautiful that we can share as people who have been sick for a very long time. And if you guys are, you know, suffering or going through any of your issues, you know, hopefully you get something good from here. And then if you can spread the love, spread the awareness, uh, we're going to do that here in my channel as well. So Without further ado, let's get right into it, Miranda. I wanted to start okay. by talking about when did your issues start? You know, what were some of your primary symptoms <clears throat> that you had when uh, you started suffering from this issues? How and how did you find out that you had pulmonary fibrosis? Um, and leading up to that time, can you explain how old were you in the beginning of how everything started? Okay, so. Um... <clears throat> Sorry, I have to like keep clearing my throat. That's like, like another <laughs> side effect from the, the lung stuff. But basically, okay. um, I started, uh, I was diagnosed with uh, juvenile arthritis, um, juvenile polyarticular arthritis, which is basically um, juvenile, meaning, you know, a young kid, polyarticular, mm -hmm. meaning more than one, um, I guess you could say, joints. And then arthritis, everybody knows what arthritis is. Um, right. So pretty much I was nine years old when I was diagnosed with that. Uh, my arthritis is um, genetic, it's hereditary. My mom has it, my mother's mom has it, which is my grandma, and um, I have it too. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so pretty much I was, uh, they put me on medications I used to be on methotrexate, uh, folic acid, uh, what else, uh, embryo. And uh, between the ages 9 and 12, um, it was mostly arthritis. The, you know, the pain that I was going through, I couldn't move my joints. I would wake up with stiff hands. Um, there was times that I had to wake up and put my hands under warm, lukewarm water or, like, you know, move my hands like this and my feet. So I can feel the motion before going to school. So pretty much um, methotrexate was helping. But there was a time where my doctors had to cut it off completely and transition me to Embro because they thought that the methotrexate probably caused uh, damage to my lungs. But later on along the line, whenever I got older, they think it was more of a 
induced by my arthritis. I think there's a specific word for that. I'm not, I can't think about it right now at the top of my head. But it's like um, basically my arthritis attacked my lungs and it caused lung damage. It caused lung scarring, which is pretty much pulmonary fibrosis. So I was diagnosed with PF um, when I was 12 years old in February of 2008. So I was about to be 13. And um, uh, I didn't really know much about it until I was, I want to say, 18 years old. I didn't know how severe PF was. I didn't know it was a terminal lung illness. I didn't know it was a death sentence. I didn't know that um, the life expectancy, uh, once you get diagnosed, it's three to five years. You know, um, I could probably wow. say that this this year, actually, uh, February 2024, I will be uh, a 16 years pulmonary fibrosis survivor. 16 years, you know, going strong. You beat um, the odds. I did. You beat I did. The odds. <laughs> and um, so, pretty much, you know, going back to whenever I was diagnosed with PF, I didn't know. Actually, I didn't know anything. So basically, the one that got the news was my mother. You know, she's always been the advocate for me and always spoke for me on my mm -hmm. behalf growing up because I was a kid. So she would be the one speaking to my doctors. She would be the ones doing my appointments, um, <clears throat> taking me to all my appointments, you know, just uh, being the one that talks to me. I just talks for me. I would just show up, do tests and just go home. And pretty much, you know, growing up, I was I grew up. uh as a normal kid, you know, as, as every normal kid does, but I had a little bit of more um, doctor visits than usual. Um, mm -hmm. I, I did start experiencing shortness of breath um, a little bit before I was officially diagnosed with PF. And I was always exempt from PE class. They would put me on the bleachers and the kids would be like, why is she on the bleachers? Like, why can I be on the bleachers? And like, I would, <laughs> I was just not an active kid. Because on top of the shortness of breath that I would experience, I also had joint pain with uh, arthritis. Mm. Um, I couldn't do push-ups. I still can't do a push-up. Um, I can't really, like, if you see my hands, I can't do, like, the 90 degree that oh, people do with their hands. I can't bend them. I have very limited uh, joint flexibility. I guess you could say limited flexibility. Um, what else I can't do? If I do, like three jumping jacks i'm already out of breath like it's it's crazy oh, i've never been an active kid um and i think it's because of the the restrictiveness of pf you know and the thing about it is that i didn't know like i said earlier i didn't know what i had until i became an adult i started looking into my illness because it started affecting me Sorry, mm, sorry. Gradually, and I'm actually pretty grateful that I didn't know because if I would have known what I know now about, you know, the life expectancy that it's it's terminal, it there's no cure, it's it's progressive and it's very damaging. Um, I probably would have lived a very stressful and anxious uh, teenagehood. I probably would have been a very anxious kid. I would have lived my life in fear. I wouldn't have done the things I achieved as a young mother because I did become a mom with PF, which is very uncommon and very, um, they're against it. The doctors are against that kind of stuff. Yeah. Being um, pregnant and having, having PF, uh, we can go, you know, a little bit further into, into that throughout my timeline. And then also, yeah. um, what else? Um, I don't know what else. <laughs> oh no! So so then, so <clears throat> how, so how old are you now? So people can get an idea. Okay. How long. So you were you were diagnosed at twelve, and then you really didn't have an idea until you were older no. what you were actually suffering from. And you know, to be honest, I even it's a little bit of a blessing that the fact that you didn't know what was going on because yeah, like you said, you would have been so much more anxious throughout your time uh, growing up. Uh, but how was your 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 teenage years? Uh, how did you feel like you were changing when you were getting into your 20s? And then you told me that you became uh, a mom. So mm -hmm. how was that like? So 
was it an accidental pregnancy or did you really want to become a mom? <laughs> and, okay. uh, you know, what were some of the things that the doctor said to you? Uh, because if anybody, maybe there is another woman right. maybe around your age, right, and having similar issues, uh, I want them to hear from your experience what it was like. Where was your mindset at? How did all that happen, if you can share that with us? Okay, so I'm currently 28 years old. Um, I became pregnant around 21, turning 22. My daughter was born in July. And I'm from September, so I was like 21, almost 22. So okay. I actually met my husband when I was 18. Right after high school, I met him. Um, and we got together. We started dating very quickly. And then I got pregnant around. We, well, we got married around 19-ish, almost 20. And then I got pregnant. And it wasn't an accident. It wasn't. We weren't preventing it, it, preventing it but we weren't going for it. It's like, if it happens, it happens, like whatever. Right. But at the time, I didn't even know that it was so, they were so against being a pregnant mom with um, with pulmonary fibrosis. Because actually, if you look up on Google, there's very limited data with women that have had successful pregnancies without any um, consequence either during pregnancy or after. And it's this specific word, it's called maternal mor morbidity or mortality, meaning it's going to either lead you to death. And um, and that will probably kill you and the baby. Yeah, it, it can oh. cause a lung failure. Uh, my lungs can collapse. I can have um, some kind of a, you know, during labor i can either pass or the baby can pass away to uh either she makes it or i make it or neither of us do um right. you know so <clears throat> when i found out i was pregnant <clears throat> i was very scared i was and um oh, man, I can't, my husband my husband, I can't my husband was <laughs> i was i was like oh my gosh what have i gotten myself into now i have to go to the doctor and I was, I was already married and I was 21 and I was like, oh my God, my mom is going to kill me. I was <laughs> so scared. And when I told her, she was a little mad. She said, you can't get pregnant. You know this. She was very, very, she didn't get like iffy, like how Latina moms are like, oh my God, like why? You know, no, she was like mad. She was like, I can't believe it. Like you can't, you know, your doctors have always told you that you can't have kids because right. of your illness and i'm just like i don't know why so <clears throat> i am um for myself personally i was not going to terminate because that's just my belief for myself okay. um and when i went to the doctor to the mfm which is maternal fetal uh clinic um they referred me to my pulmonologist because i did tell them that i, I had pulmonary fibrosis and also have arthritis and then they took me to uh they referred me to a pulmonologist and a rheumatologist to check on me, follow up. Mm -hmm. They asked me what kind of medications am I on? And I was like, none. They said, when's the last time you've ever been on medications? And I told them I haven't been on any medications for not for PF, never from arthritis. The last time I was on medications was when I was 17. And they said, so you just went off the radar from ages 17 to now to 20, 21. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah. And they said, why? And I told them because I didn't have insurance. I wasn't um, gonna, you know, I didn't have insurance. And then they said, um, okay, you know, you're pretty lucky. So then they took me in and then I started seeing um, this pulmon pulmonologist and uh, she was like, you know, it, it's a little bit of a blur, exactly what she said. But I do remember she said that we don't judge, but you should think about, you have uh, options. You should think about your life. Um, and it's very uh, high risk for you to proceed with this pregnancy. You know, we'll give you some time to think about it. And at the time, um, abortion was legal in Texas, which we're talking about like 2016, 2017. And okay. they said that, you know, if, if I wanted to go that route, that there was no judgment, um, we were gonna just do it for my health, for my, um, for my safety. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I said, no, I felt offended. I said, no, my mom was there too. She remembers this. And then um, they were like, okay, cool. That's fine. That's what you want to do. That's fine. And they 
gave me the consequences. They told me what, what can happen. Um, and then I think I was asked about two more times if I wanted to continue this pregnancy. And I said, yes, I do. I want to. So mm. they followed up with me. I was, I was considered high risk throughout my home pregnancy. I would have uh, constant appointments with them. I think it was about, at first it was like um, every other week. And then it was weekly as soon as I got bigger. And I can say that they were so impressed with my pregnancy because um, I didn't need supplemental oxygen like I need it now. Mm. I didn't need any kind of medication. Uh, they monitored me to an extent because since you're pregnant, there's limited options that you can have, like uh, limited testings, just so it won't affect the baby, like uh, to expose them to radiation and stuff like that. Um, they, I can't take certain medications like for when you get a cold, like Tylenol is a little bit, it's not good no. for you to take Tylenol. I don't know why, but it's just like certain things that we have limited access to in order to keep the baby safe. So um, my pregnancy was pretty smooth and sorry, my daughter just came in and she it's like right. messed me up. <laughs> um, okay. It was pretty, don't it worry. was pretty smooth. And <clears throat> I went um, full term. They didn't let me go to 40 weeks. I was like very angry when I, I couldn't go 40 weeks. They actually <laughs> made me get induced there. And I was like, you know what? Okay. I'm just giving. Cause I, y'all been, y'all been like trying to control me. I guess we can do 39 weeks in six days. Like it was just one day off that she could have been 40 weeks. Mm. So she was still considered full term. So I remember I went to the hospital and my husband and I went to the hospital early in the morning around 8 AM. And they said, that I, they were suggesting for me to get like the, um, what is that called? Whenever they give you that specific thing on the back, in your back, what is it? Pitocin or it's just to induce labor. So I was like, okay. no, I don't want to, I didn't want that. And then my mom's like, mm, you should get it. Like, you're going to get scared. And I told her, all right, they convinced me. I wanted okay. to go natural, but I feel like maybe that was a good choice for me to get that, um, that medication i forgot the word yeah. for it honestly but i think if you're a mom you know what it is like if whoever's listening they know what i'm talking about um so i got that and then they induced my labor i was in labor for 17 hours my daughter did not want to come out and they they gave me um <laughs> did not want a chance out. yeah she did not want to come out they gave me a chance and they said if she doesn't come out in within from here into 30 minutes or whatever we're gonna take you into a c-section but before they induced me, they said that they wanted to just take me to get a C-section right away. They wanted okay. to schedule me right away for a C-section. They did not want me to go no, um, natural. And I said, no, I wanted to try at least to go natural. And that's when they told me um, that if for any reason during labor, if for some reason the baby's in distress, that they were going to put me down and they were going to, you know, take her out and open me up. And then I would wake up hours later after she was born. And I would not experience the joy of seeing my daughter being born until hours later, until I woke up from, you know, um, from surgery. And I was, they were trying to like gaslight me into going straight into a C-section, mm. but I, something, in, something in me said, no, like, I was like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to prove them wrong. And I did, I was um, in labor for 17 hours. And then it was just like, whenever my um, water broke, they were trying to break my water. And I said, no, like, just give me some time time um like as soon as i said that five minutes later like my daughter broke my own water she was coming out and wow. i was like okay i'm ready to push i'm ready to push and they said no just wait and i said no i'm ready like i felt it it was it was such a the feeling is so different it's so weird and i don't yeah. want to get into the gory side of it but it's just like you could you could just tell you know you know and um i i kid you not like three pushes and she came out Wow. It was so it was so quick. It was so um relieving and they were so impressed. They were so impressed that I think two days after <clears throat> my daughter was born, I had a room full of doctors and students come into the room like a Grey's Anatomy episode. Like I'm not even <laughs> exaggerating. There was like fifteen to twenty doctors in there in front of me and they were like asking me all kinds of questions and then they said um i remember one of them she was like 
I'm not going to lie to you. I read your chart. Like when we're on our way over here to meet you. And I was not expecting to see a person like you. I was expecting to see someone that looks so sick. And I thought you were crazy. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I can't believe, like, how do you feel? Like what? They were just so impressed. And I felt like a celebrity. I felt like really good about this. And I thought, okay, you know, nice. And then that's whenever they, they kind of said that I was a, my daughter was a miracle. Wow. Uh, a medical, a medical miracle. She was, and um, I was just very lucky. I was very lucky to to be able to experience motherhood and have a very smooth and um, easy pregnancy, even though I was considered high risk. So, uh, to me, I think my daughter is my biggest blessing, and um, she is uh, she she is my biggest blessing, like overall, and right. she's my greatest gift. Awesome. Um, by the way, you do, you just sound like a superwoman. <laughs> like you sound like a su complete superwoman. You're just going through every hurdle that life is throwing at you and just jumping over it was like no problem. So I give you so much props for that. Uh, I was going to ask you a quick question regarding your daughter. Um, yeah. So since you said that your arthritis was chronic, uh, there's a high likelihood that she'll also be, um, What's the word I'm looking for here? The, it's she'll probably genetic. Be, yeah, eventually yeah. she would probably, and you know, maybe, yeah, God maybe, willing, God willing, that's not, not, but there's a possibility that she can suffer from that, right? Um, and th is there also yeah. a possibility that she can also eventually end up having, um, pulmonary fibro yeah, pulmonary fibrosis, fibrosis, fibrosis. <laughs> fibrosis. Mm, fibrosis. yes, and yes, and no, so the arthritis does spread in the family with my mom and my mom and my grandma through my mom's side. My daughter might, and she could potentially get arthritis, but I feel like if she ever does, I would learn from the mistakes, the medical mistakes that happened to me. Like I would avoid methotrexate. I would make, find other alternatives to control her arthritic pain. If she does have arthritis, um, but as far as her uh, to develop PF, there is a chance. But for me, my PF was not is not genetic. It's not familial pulmonary fibrosis, which means it's like it runs in the family. Right. Is uh, because of the uh, the uh, autoimmune condition, which is arthritis. For some reason, my body just decided to attack my lungs because my mom doesn't have PF, nor does my grandma. Like mm. they are, they're the only one, they're the only ones that have arthritis in my family and they don't have the lung condition. It was just me. So that's why I'm a little iffy about maybe arthritis did cause it, or maybe it was the medication because I did come across other um, pulmonary fibrosis survivors that have received methotrexate and their doctors told them that the medication is probably the reason why they developed PF in the first place. Mm, wow. <clears throat> so bringing us back now to date, uh, and by the way, thank you for sharing that because I know that's a uh, very, touch very uh, touchy subject for you. Yeah. And I know how much you want to keep fighting for your daughter. I think that's like a, a very good source of motivation for you. <laughs> I was going to ask you, so then bringing us up to date now, what, are, what, ha what have the doctor said to you? Uh, what are your options? I know I mentioned it earlier in the video. And um, what is it that you're dealing with? What are your symptoms now? Maybe some of the things and things you can't do. Like, what is it that you're going through? Uh, and what is it like living now with, you know, as you get older? Because as many of us understand, it, the issues keep going downhill, you know, so as soon as you're diagnosed. So, you yeah. know, how far along are you with the <clears throat> symptoms? And um, what, what are the plans for, for the future here? So to continue my medical uh, mystery, because that's pretty much what it is, um, you know, fast forward to, I had my daughter in 2017 in July. So I actually started developing a little flare, which I thought was my arthritis. And it'll, it'll come together mm -hmm. once you, once you hear what I'm trying to say. Um, okay. Basically around late 2018, my daughter was about a year ish, a year and a half. 
so let's say around uh, October of 2018, all the way up to February of 2020, before COVID hit um, here in the US, I had a massive, massive flare that I do not wish upon anyone. And I thought it was my arthritis. Because for some reason, my arthritis just became mm. like, um, <clears throat> what's that word called? Not dormant. There's a specific word for it when in remission. So okay. my arthritis went into remission for some reason. I don't know why. So I thought that I was getting a flare because I just had this baby, you know, and maybe my mm. daughter, uh, you know, this pregnancy woke up the beast again, you know, arthritis. And then um, between 2018 and 2020, I didn't have insurance again. I don't know what is up with this. It was like, it was <laughs> life. It was just life, life, life uh, experiences and just things that happened in life that I lost my insurance. So pretty much um, I wasn't able to have access to the doctors until February 2020 when I received insurance again at the end of 2019. But throughout that year gap that I'm talking about, like 2018 to 2020, the flares that I was getting were so immense that whenever I would change my daughter's diapers, like her little kicks would feel like a grown man was punching me. It, wow. And then whenever she would grab me with her little fingers, like my, she would, she would grab my fingers with her hand. It felt like she was ready to like break off my fingers. So wow. <clears throat> I was also experiencing a lot of uh, limitations, like trying to lift my shoulders above my, my, um, my arms above my shoulders i couldn't walk for a long period of time or sit up i couldn't basically hold my weight to sit down i would need people to help me or i would just like sit down and like throw myself in the couch and then like ask for someone to pick me up and it would hurt when they would grab me i felt like i was um in so much pain i felt like my skin was on fire and um it was just a different kind of flare so when i went to the rheumatologist and i told him hey I need Embro again because I feel like um, I'm flaring up. So they did this testing, like a full panel test to see what's going on. <clears throat> and I actually tested positive for a Joe one antibody, which is um, an antibody um, to basically say that I was positive with something called myositis, specifically dermatomyositis. And it's also an autoimmune condition that goes in par with PF and arthritis like it's all under the little same family like they're all in the little same gang so <clears throat> they told me that i was eventually gonna develop dm because of pf and because of ra which is rheumatoid arthritis so they said that most likely my pregnancy flared it up and i first i didn't believe them but then coming across other people with dm that have that have developed dm which is dermatomyositis and I'm just going to abbreviate it because it's a pretty long word. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I even, have, I even have a struggle pronouncing yeah. it myself. Yeah. <laughs> so um, um, I'm in like groups with people that have DM and women say, you know, I was actually uh, diagnosed with it after I had my baby. And, you know, they think my pregnancy flared up and I was like, okay, I guess they were right. So mm. I developed, uh, I was officially diagnosed with dermatomyositis in February of 2020 not even like a week before we went on lockdown. So I, I suffered through lockdown with physical pain. So what dermatomyositis is, is actually um, muscle and skin inflammation. And it also causes muscle um, deterioration, which I think is called muscle dystrophy. It basically eats up your muscle mass and um, it causes a lot of weakness. And if it's not uh, quickly diagnosed, it can be very, um, it can be deadly and it can also cause a um, motion of your legs. I think I did come across another person on social media that lost uh, motion of her legs and she had to learn how to walk again and she has DM as well. So I didn't mm -hmm. go that far, but they said that if I would have gone a few more months without being treated with DM, I probably would have been the same and um, um yeah and ever since then it was kind of a wake-up call and i was like you know what i need to start taking care of myself more because of this little girl like my daughter so then mm -hmm. whenever they diagnosed me with that they put me on a bunch of medications right off the bat and i'm talking about i was not on medications for a very long time since i was like 17 or 18. so mm -hmm. i was at this time i was around 22. 
they put me on prednisone, 40 milligrams. They put me on azathioprine. They put me on pantoprazole, which is for, I think, for GERD. Acid and, reflux. Uh, yeah, acid reflux. Yeah, yeah. Of <laughs> and then they put me on, I'm not sure what else. They put me on other, other little things. So pretty much um, they started me on a high dosage prednisone. And it caused um, some kind of acne, which is called a steroid-induced acne. And I had, like, a bunch of pimples, like, all over my chest. And it was going up to my neck. It was very, very nasty. Um, we can show that <laughs> on the screen right now, too. Keep yeah, going. of course. I'm trying to clear my throat real quick. It's okay. It's okay. <clears throat> Um, I was going to ask you, by the way, um, quick question. Okay. So can you tell me if, or did the doctor say anything re in regards to would you have, would it have made a difference if you were, would have taken the medication from the age you were 17 to up to when you started taking the medication again, by the way? Well, uh, for arthritis? Yeah, or, or anything medication. else. Yeah, because you said you were like you said that you stopped taking medication, and then you got on them yeah. again. Like exactly. So at that point, would it have made a difference? I well, so basically, I've never actually been to this day on medication for fibrosis for PF. Okay. Okay. And the reason being is because, um, well, I can't really. I don't want to skip. So I'll, I'll I'll let you know exactly why they didn't even want me. Yeah, so they didn't really want me to want to put me on medications. But I think at the time, when I was uh, in my early um, adulthood years, they I don't, I'm not sure, don't quote me on this, but I think there wasn't any medications approved yet mm. to slow down the progression of fibrosis. Um, or I would, and, and on top of that, I wasn't really seeing any doctors because I have lack of insurance. So I didn't know where to go. Um, but pretty much I think I was on the, where was I? um with the medication oh with with the, the, rashes, with the so I, i'm showing yeah. that on the screen right now and yeah i can yeah it looks really it, and that was like the first day so it got really really big so then that's whenever the other this uh, is first day yeah this was like a fir the wow. first week i just got that like right away so they told me that the oh, doctor no. that gave me the medication he shouldn't have put me on high on a high dosage right away he should have like slowly gradually increased it instead of just giving me 40 milligrams off the bat so then they brought me down to 20 milligrams i gained so much weight um and i what was it i gained so much weight and then i slowly started decreasing to five milligrams of um prednisone until it just wasn't helping anymore i was still feeling the the pain of the myositis so that's whenever they decided to put me on infusions which is ivig gamma guard specifically and then they also put me on Rituxan and the Gamma Guard, I was taking it every month and the Rituxan was every six months at the time. And then I started developing this weird cough. Um, and um, at the time, my, my PF was still stable. I forgot to mention that when I was pregnant, I was on 46% total lung capacity. And uh, around the time, whenever all this derm dermatomyositis was happening, my total lung capacity was around 35 percent so they weren't really because they weren't really 35 or 37 they weren't really um concerned because it wasn't really dropping so much it was more like a like a small like decrease for for that amount of time like for those years it, it was it was pretty normal i would say it wasn't so, so concerning for them so from your i don't want to interrupt you but so from your yeah. knowledge <clears throat> the, the a normal lung capacity is what a hundred percent is that like a normal or is it like 80 90 around there i believe so i think okay. anything over 90 is anything anything over 70 i think i've seen yeah. it on the chart on, on my on my chart i think any, anything over 70 percent is considered normal i think 100 is like perfect like you have athlete michael, lungs. michael phelps or something <laughs> yeah. yeah so um for both of my lungs i i've I don't even know what my total lung capacity was whenever I was diagnosed with uh, PF because I just don't have access to that stuff anymore. We're talking about like things from 2008 or nine. Like mm -hmm. I have no idea. I don't have access yeah. to that. Yeah. So 
pretty much I think I, I have a good um, understanding of where I started around 46% when I was pregnant in 2017. Gotcha. And then it just started slowly decreasing to like 42 and then 35. So <clears throat> whenever I started developing this weird cough, I started throwing up every day for like a whole year every day and i started losing a lot of weight um, they put me uh they sent me to gi i got an endoscopy they didn't find anything but inflammation in my esophagus and in my stomach there was no hiatal hernia because i had told i've been told that i had a possible small hiatal hernia from a ct scan i think that they it could be possible but with this endoscopy mm -hmm. They said that there was nothing. And then I was like, okay, so what is making me cough? I believe there was the IVIG. That was my personal belief. My doctors didn't agree with that. But I think my insurance didn't want to keep paying anymore. So I said, okay, whatever. I don't want to get it anymore because they're not going to pay for it. So whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I completely weaned off the IVIG. And I, I'm not lying to you. <clears throat> The coughing, the weird cough, and growing up daily for a whole year, like, it just stopped. It stopped, and wow. I told them, I'm telling you, the IVIG messed me up. Like, mm -hmm. I and, – and the side effects from that medication was so bad, I couldn't tolerate the light. I was like a vampire. Like, as soon as I, as soon as I got home, I needed to be under the covers for, like, from three to five days. I did not want to move because I felt like everything was trembling around me. I did not want to hear people talk because their voice sounded so loud to me. I was having chills. I was having uh, hot flash. I was sweating. I was cold. I was hot. I was uh, sensitive to light. My head, I had a massive headache. And this would last for like a week every month. And then on top of that, I was like throwing up. So it was very, very... It was a bad um, <clears throat> side effect for me personally. I know it's worked for other people, but for me, it didn't work. And then um, the rituxan has been good to me. Um, that one actually helped me like wean down a little bit of the pain with uh, DM. And it also helped bring down the inflammation of my lungs because everything that I have is inflammation pretty much. You know, mm -hmm. arthritis is inflammation pulmonary fibrosis is scarring in the lungs, but it also right. has a lot to do with inflammation. And then DM is also inflammation in the skin and the muscles. So what rituxan does, it helps like bring down the inflammation. And it's been pretty good to me so far. <clears throat> and um, I haven't had any crazy side effects like IVIG, but I lost a lot of weight. And because I lost over 40 pounds in under six wow. months, when they tried to put me on Celsept or the other medication for uh, pulmonary fibrosis, it's called, give me a minute. It's okay. I think it's I'm, called, just, I'm just listening to all these medications <clears throat> and I'm like, oh my God, it's yeah. just so many. <laughs> it's called OFEB, sorry. OFEB or Esbriate. They're the only two medications that are out in the market to help with uh, slow, slowing uh, fibrosis, uh, you know, till the day. When they tried to put me on those two medications, they said, we can't put you on OFEV or on Espriate because it causes diarrhea and it causes weight loss. And you're mm -hmm. at a very, very, very low weight for your size and for your height. I was almost 100 pounds. I haven't been this skinny yeah. since elementary school. So that's whenever they told me, um, you know, um, they couldn't put me on that. So they were trying to figure out what's going to happen with me. And then I caught COVID. Oh my gosh. I freaking caught COVID. I man. was, I was gotta, I was, you know, uh, that was one of my questions <coughs> too. I was going to ask you, how was it, you know, like catching COVID, especially with someone who already has a pulmonary disease. Uh, I can't even imagine how that's like, yeah. um, you know, it, whether, you know, people have different opinions on it, but correct. You know, I've, caught it before and it made me feel like crap so uh, i can't even imagine how it made you feel how was that like so i got covid when my daughter was five so i think it was around july it was for a birthday party too around there it was in july of 2022 and i 
didn't know I had it until I decided to test for it. And, and then it came out positive. It's like another pregnancy test in the restroom. Um, yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, like what's going to happen? I didn't tell anyone. I did not tell anyone. Hold on, let me just close the door real quick. It's Hold okay, no problem. No problem. <sighs> Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> A little take okay. five. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't tell anyone that I had COVID. And I was so disappointed because I tried my hardest to avoid it because mm. it was killing people, especially people with immunosupress, immunosuppress, uh, immunocompromised people, especially mm. people with lung disease. You know, I'm in these groups on social media that have like communities with like PF and pulmonary hypertension, cystic fibrosis, you know, all these kinds of interstitial lung diseases. And uh, the amount of people that I've seen die from COVID with such weak lungs, it scared the crap out of me. So whenever I caught it, I was like, oh my God, like what's going to happen? So I messaged my doctor on my chart and I told her, I have COVID. What can I do? And then she said, I'm going to send you this five day medication. Take it. So I did. I took it and it cleared it. It cleared up. But the damage was permanent because I'm here today with oxygen and I'm waiting on a lung transplant because I caught COVID. I, this is my opinion. My lung capacity dropped oh. from like 30 something for such a long time. Like I'm talking about my pregnancy time and years with dermatomyositis affecting my body and stuff like that. And then once I caught COVID in July of 2022, in my chart, you see that drop like boom it dropped so bad and my lung capacity dropped to like 20 something i think 28 around there um and that's whenever yeah, my doctors really started bad. like the doctor started trying to see me every four months instead of every six months <clears throat> you have that your name image? On the screen. yeah i do go ahead <clears throat> i have it on the screen now i can't even tell like i can't even see like the percentage but yeah, yeah you can see just that yeah, you see that crazy November drop? 1st, 2021, and then you can visibly see the crazy. It's like a roller coaster drop. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Wow. Yeah, so yeah. I'm here chewing something in my <laughs> in, the, in my mouth. I like, you don't hear that. But basically, okay. um, <sighs> July 2022, it's whenever, like, the side effects of, of COVID for me personally, I caught it once, thankfully. I don't even know how I survived that because thinking back on how I was coughing, it's like, it's such a, a very strong cough. It, it, it was so bad and congesting to me that I was like, how the heck did I survive that? Like, how did I, how did my, how were, wow. what kind of damage did my lungs do in order for me to keep living so you know i'm glad i got that medication that five-day medication to clear my lungs out but it was it was bad and i yeah. i told my family oh it's just a cold it's just a cold but no it was covid and um i caught that and then after i believe it was 2022 of july i went back to get a follow-up and i think around may of 2023 is when my pulmonologist told me, um, we're seeing a very quick decline in your PFTs. Um, and I think you need to consider thinking about the option of uh, possibly pursuing a lung transplant. <clears throat> and I was like, Ooh. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. But you know, I, I just thought about it right now. I kind of skipped over whenever I started using supplemental oxygen. So I just wanted to add that I started using supplemental oxygen around, when was this? February of 2022, 2021, 2022. I was using it like when needed, when needed. So whenever I felt like really out of breath, I would just put that little, that little box machine, a little backpack machine. Um, and I would just like breathe for a little bit and then put it up because I just, I was able to still like, move without it and on top of that I was a little self-conscious about have being seen in public with that 
loud machine. Like it was hissing. It was very, very uncomfortable. And people right. just look at me very weird. So um, I was very self-conscious about wearing that thing around me. But now I just don't care. Like I use my big, big oxygen okay. metal cylinder. Okay. And it's very, it's very quiet. But you can clearly see it like when it's like I'm dragging it behind me. So I, I prefer the big cylinder than that little backpack right there. Um, yeah. Cause that one's very loud. So I was using that backpack for well, like, is, that, is it actually loud? Like it makes a, yeah. lot, of, makes a lot of noise. Yes. It, it goes, it goes like, and then it goes, and I'm just like, Oh my God. Oh, imagine, go, imagine going to the movies with that. And then like, you're at the movies <laughs> and you just hear like, or like at a restaurant, like it's embarrassing. Oh, so man. I tried not to use it as much as I could. And it was always like, are you using your oxygen? Yeah, when needed. I use it. I use it whenever I need to like walk, you know, from the house to the car or like to the store. But I was, uh, I think that's whenever the first picture that they took of me with that oxygen tank, I went to the Grand Canyon. And I, it was like maybe a week before I went to that, to that trip. That, that's when they told me that I needed to be on oxygen. And it was another wake up call. I'm like, oh my God, like <sighs> my health is declining. You know, I can't believe that, you know, everything's just falling downhill from here because of that COVID. Um, but anyways, fast forward to May of 2023 is when my pulmonologist, she said that I need to consider um, thinking about pursuing a lung transplant. She was very confident that I could be a good candidate because I'm pretty healthy overall when it comes to my organs and, and, you know, my whole body other than my lungs. So she said, you know, I can refer you to the transplant clinic here at the hospital, but I just need you to tell me if you want to. And I said, I don't know. Like, let me think about it. Let me talk. To you. Okay. We'll schedule another appointment for September of 2023. And then you'll let me know what you decide. And I said, okay. So I told my family before I went to the hospital in September, I told my mom and my dad, um, and my husband and um i told them hey i want you guys to come with me to the hospital because my pulmonologist wants to talk to you guys and they said about what and i said i just need to i just need you to guys to go like it's it's important and i had already told my husband about it she, he was a little sad of course i mean who who's gonna be happy with this kind of news um and i, I didn't know what i was getting myself into so we went to the doctor that day and that's when my doctor was telling them explaining to them that you know my health started declining very fast and um, I should consider um maybe a, a chance at a better uh prolonging my quality of life with possibly being given a chance to receive healthy lungs and um it was it was a very um it was just very difficult to hear this and I told my doctor, like, I don't like for people to BS around me. You know, I didn't tell her that, obviously, but I was just like, you know, let's just get to the point. Yeah. How long do you think I have? And she would never tell me this. But I asked her in May, I was like, how long do you think I have? She's like, I don't want to get to that right now. Like, you know, just think about it. And I'm like, okay. And I asked her, like, just tell me straight up. Like I did. I was like, just tell me straight up. How long do you think I have if I don't pursue these, uh, this uh, lung transplant? And she said, in my professional opinion, and by how fast you're declining, I believe that your lungs can your lungs can last you between 18 to 24 months max. And nice. I freaking started crying. I was like, oh, oh my God. I felt like this gasp in me. And I'm like, okay, all right. So um, then I told, uh, I was just looking at my parents and I looked at my husband and I said, all right, refer me. Refer, refer me to the pulmonologist the transplant pulmonologist and we'll we'll start you made the and decision right there and then i did i did because i i i had been told since may of 2023 and then i went to go see her again mm -hmm. in september so it's like four months later um i already knew that i needed to get a lung transplant but i was like coping with the news and i i i fell into a kind of a dark place Around there, I was trying to uh, figure out what I wanted to do with my life, and I was trying to um, accept it. You know, and now I'm a little more accepting with this kind of news. Whenever I get like bad news here and there, like small bumps on the road, um, my mentality has changed a lot. And I'm I'm telling you this like 
uh, you know, everything that's been happening to me lately since 2023, you know, from the, the decline of my health, my view on life has been very different. I see de- life differently and it's like a, it's a, in a good way. Um, and it makes wow. you appreciate life a little more. So whenever they referred me to the transplant clinic, I saw them around September, but then I had like a little, a little bump again with the transplant clinic. And I had to stop the process. And then they saw me again in November. But when they saw me again in November, they saw this massive decline again in my lung um, capacity. And that's when the doctor told me that day. I was just there for a routine, you know, visit to start again the process to start the testing and like schedule all the tests that I need to do. And he said, hey, um, why don't we just admit you today? And then you stay in the hospital for five days and just get all these tests done in five days. And I'm just like, what? And he said, yeah. Because um, it just looks like, you know, you should probably like, this This needs to be expedited. Wow. And I said, okay. And we were not ready. I didn't even, I went, I was admitted to the hospital and I didn't even have a, a phone charger with me. So my husband had to go back home and make me a bag and meet me at the hospital room. And on November 1st of 2023, I was admitted to the hospital um, for five days and I was, tested from head to toe and i have the list of all the tests that they did if you want me to read them um but yeah for for five days yeah of course so um i needed to see a cardiologist i needed to see neurology a dermatologist i needed to get my uh teeth uh cleared make sure that my teeth were in perfect pristine conditions like no cavities or no um no nothing to like nothing major and like no nothing to pull out or whatever because mm-hmm. apparently um oral hygiene has a lot to do with uh your transplanted lungs to like keep them healthy and like avoid uh rejection or like avoid some kind mm-hmm. of infection which is like they're very very sensitive and then i saw a worker and i saw the dietitian i got an mri scan they did a carotid droppler on me bone density an esophagram a fluoroscopy diaphragm um they did like a lung scan and echo with bubble study um they did a two view chest x-ray ct chest of my abdomen of my pelvis with contrast an upper gi um and then they also did a right heart cath they went through here Um. and then they went they went down all the way to my heart and um and they did a bronchoscopy. No, they did not do a bronchoscopy because I had already done one. So they accepted those tests from that First bronchoscopy. Test. I did a 24-hour uh, urine collection test. And then um, they drew a bunch of labs. Like, I'm talking about, like, maybe 30 tubes of labs. Um, they did an EKG, right. pulmonary function test, an ABG, and then a pap smear. So they did all that. And then I think I also had to get clearance from a psycho- psychologist. And it was a lot. It was a lot. It was very heavy. The most of the tests were pretty easy for me, but the hardest one at the time was the right heart cath because I was awake. Mm. They couldn't put me down because I had eaten. And then they told me that they were not gonna do it that day. But then they came and they said, Hey, we're ready to see you. You know, we're ready to take you in. And I'm like, No, you guys told me that y'all were not gonna see me today. And I was eating and then he said, Oh my gosh, let me talk to the surgeon. So then he went he came back and he said, The surgeon says that he needs to do it today. Cause it was Friday and then they said they don't do surgery on Saturday and Sunday. And he said, he's going to do it today. We're going to be awake. So they kind of sedated me a little bit like in the area. And then I mm-hmm. was awake and it felt very uncomfortable. It felt like they put like, um, mm-hmm. like, a how can I say it? Like, like one of these, I don't know what this is called. I forgot a cannula. No, and they were just like pushing it in there. And I'm like, Oh my God, like so uncomfortable. <laughs> it was very, like very a uncomfortable. Pepper, like a little, yes. Yeah very uncomfortable and he was like digging in there and i'm just like oh my god like all right cool so um very uncomfortable but it was a i couldn't talk i couldn't talk and i was very scared of moving and then they said that i had to keep pressure on it because i can bleed out and i'm like wow thank you for telling me this now um but then this was all in the time span of five days right yeah five days wow yeah and then uh also i think they did a 
the barium testing where I would do like the swallow test. The barium swallow. Yeah. And then they also noticed that my swallows weren't weren't that good or like the food wasn't going down. So then I got a manometry test um, done and esophageal it manometry. Sucks. Yeah, I hated that test. Oh my it gosh. Sucks. It does. And then I also got a pH 24 hour test that I took home. Mm. You know, they put like a little cap down my nose and then to my stomach. And I had like this little thing hanging around my neck. And for 24 hours to check if I had acid reflux, I couldn't eat. I couldn't even eat soup. Oh, man. It was so hard to swallow with that thing down my neck, um, down my throat. And um, I did good on that test. But then I, I kind of knew like when you know, you know, whenever you don't do something right or you don't do good in something. And I felt like um, the esophageal manometry test was going to come back with bad results. Because I, yeah. I, I struggled a lot and I, I cried during that test because I was just very getting very anxious and the I guess the person that was doing the test was getting a little iffy because I couldn't stop swallowing for 30 seconds and I asked mm. her like how many times do you want me to do this and she said 10 and I told her I can't even do one and we were there oh. for like two hours max like two and a half hours and she just like recorded what she could she put on on the data that i couldn't i couldn't stop swallowing for 15 seconds um so you know um i was told that i needed to see the doctor soon enough and they told me that the news was that um they did find something on the esophageal manometry test that they saw that my esophagus the muscles in my esophagus was pretty much non-existent um hold on Sorry. Um, I, know, um, I, were, say, uh, I don't want to interrupt you, but we're going into yeah. an hour. Let me know if you if you need a break, because I know you've been yeah. talking a lot and it's I know it's hard for you. So let me know. <laughs> you know, let I feel me know good. If, you sure? OK, just one. Yeah, I feel, I feel one good. Let me consider it. Good. Oh, good. of okay. course, I feel good. And I got my water here, too, so I can, like, clear my throat <laughs> just in case. But no, I feel I feel okay. pretty good. I feel I feel in the zone, so we can continue. Perfect. And I'll perfect. let you know if I I'll let you know if I need like a break. But pretty much Thank with you. the with the esophageal manometry test, they did tell me that they did find something, and they said that the muscles in my esophagus. And I'm pretty sure you know about this. You're pretty a pretty good expert oh, with with yeah, esophagus. So um, I, I don't really know much detail, but if you can like share what i'm trying to say like yeah. go for it so pretty much the muscles in my esophagus were pretty much non-existent yeah my food um they said like bread usually would get stuck it would just go down whenever it felt like it like food would stick there or it would just go down like gravity whenever it felt like it yeah. into my stomach and so, um it was it was going to be an issue so i got you so essentially so uh, as people that don't know, but who are here listening, <coughs> I've suffered, like I mentioned earlier in the video, from gastroesophageal reflux disease, or also known as GERD, uh, acid reflux. When you have the manometry study uh, or any of those testings, right, they try to see the strength of your, mu of your muscles or your esophagus because your esophagus works with, with muscles the way you swallow. And it's kind of it kind of works something like a snake where it like squeezes right. the food down. So when you swallow there's uh food there is muscles in your esophagus that squeeze down and go like this if you're watching uh you know <laughs> and eventually right it goes down to your stomach well part of it is because you have three phases of swallowing you have uh the voluntary one which is you are conscious that you are swallowing something and then there's a midsection and the last section and the last two are involuntary so those are the muscles that work involuntarily to just you know, uh, it, it's a natural, it's like breathing, right? You breathe, right. you don't think about it. Swallowing is the same thing. You, it just goes down your, your, your esophagus, down your throat, and eventually clears up in your stomach. So um, hopefully that helps people understand if, if you haven't experienced yeah. that. So keep going, I, Miranda. Sorry to cut you off. And I, yeah, of course. And I think the part where I have the issue is in the midsection. They said that right here where my sternum is, that's where my food gets stuck. And you know what, when I was feeling, I, there was a time about last year and the year ago that I was experiencing some bloating where my, um, uh, what is this? My rib cage would end right here in the middle. I felt like Your some sternum? bloating. Yeah. My sternum, is it my sternum? 
well yeah my sternum the bottom of my sternum where my rib yeah. cage is um i would feel some bloating here and i would like i could see it and i would like massage it like this you know um to bring it down and, and before i could eat because i could not eat if that was bloated for some reason so i thought it was stomach issues and that's why i asked them like hey refer me to gi because i might have stomach issues but it was never that it was it was my esophagus and they missed it they just said it was a bunch of inflammation they never did further testing and i felt like at the time when i went to go see gi and did that endoscopy he could have you know if he could have probably done some more testing and we probably would have caught it on time and maybe i would have been offered some kind of a surgical procedure to fix that but mm -hmm. because i my esophagus is pretty much messed up already um i don't have the option to do surgery anymore because uh the surgeries that are offered to help with your esophagus it's to essentially avoid what i already have gotcha. so it's not gonna work and that's what they told me um i think it was like two weeks ago that's what they told me um and that's when they, they also told me that i was gonna if i wanted to continue to pursue um the double lung transplant that I needed to uh, accept uh, some terms that I needed to accept that I was gonna, it's protocol for patients to go and get like a feeding tube before they did the swallow test after surgery. And they leave that feeding tube for like three weeks or so, you know, on average, just depends on the hospital that you go to what their protocol is. But here where I'm going, it's their, their protocols. Like, I think they said three weeks, but they were going to leave it off for me for three months. And I was like, okay, that's fine. Like, we'll leave a freaking tube down my nose for three months. No problem. And that's when they said, um, but with your esophagus issues, uh, we most likely will transition you into getting a feeding tube directly into your stomach. And I don't know the specific words for it. I think it's called a J G J tube or something like that. I'm very like I'm J still pouch? fairly new. It's a J tube. I think it's like okay, a little gotcha, gotcha. yeah. So I'm I'm pretty new to this stomach talk, you know, because I'm you know talk to me about lungs. I'll let you know. Like I'll <laughs> I'll tell you everything about it. But with the stomach talk, it's fairly new to me. I'm still learning. But from what I've like you know collected, they did tell me that um uh, they would have to put a a little. They would go through my directly through my stomach. And I would have to feed there for the rest of my life. And I was like, what? You know, I can't yeah. eat through my mouth anymore. What about drinking water? And they said, no, you can't um, because we want to avoid aspiration. And I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. And then I started looking into it. And um, it's very uh, dangerous to aspirate um, food into your new lungs because it will cause um, an infection. And since we're on immunosuppressants, for the rest of our life to avoid rejection from our immune system. Um, we don't have an immune system anymore with uh, transplanted lungs. So anything, mm. um, any, anything that goes into our lungs, like any foreign substance or a foreign food that goes into our lungs, it can cause an infection and it will lead to rejection and then lead to early death. So they told me that if I start eating within the first year, if I just didn't care and I started eating or like do like cheat meals, um, that most likely I wouldn't even last a year with my new lungs. So, I mean, why go through all of that trouble mm -hmm. with surgery, the recovery, and then being selfish and eat and then just waste a good pair of lungs? So pretty much what they're trying to do is save me from the trouble from getting rejection because of you know my esophagus problems so i signed off on it and i told him okay that's fine you know i've been very volunteering and very accepting with everything that's going on with me because i really want to continue to be here and i want to live and i want to keep going and see how far i can go you know i want to see my daughter grow um i want to grow old with my husband hopefully you know right. and i said okay that's fine like i'll give up food and at the time i wasn't really thinking they told me to think about it. They, did, they told me to sign off on it at the moment when they told me, but they were not going to submit it until I thought about it. And I was like, okay, what is there to think about? He's like, um, 
you need to talk about your talk to your family about it and i was like okay so when the doctor told me like it's not just giving up food it's giving up you know being able to participate in eating your birthday cakes and going on dinner dates with your husband right. going to brunch with your friends christmas parties thanksgiving dinners um and then i'm like why would you tell me this now i have to <laughs> think further but my mind was set uh you know i would i would give up you know having the the luxury of eating in order for for prolonging my life um you know i, I didn't think twice about it so mm -hmm. i told them the next day that i was gonna pursue it and i was gonna continue with the lung transplant um they did give me the option if i wanted to go to another transplant center i could but the majority of the transplant centers here in the united states they will most likely do the same protocol so what's the whole point of me going through another center and starting the process again and then wasting time if time is of essence here right. and i'm gonna still have the same outcome so um they told me this last week and then that was pretty much the last thing that i needed to accept or um yeah pretty much accept before they took my case into the uh committee and then that was two weeks ago so last week actually a week ago the um the committee did go through with my case and then um i got the call and early tuesday morning and then they said that uh <laughs> the coordinator was very nervous when she called me she was umming a lot she's like um um and then i'm like oh that's what i do in my youtube it's, channel <laughs> it's bad news i just i heard she's like um hi miranda um um well the committee um already saw your case um and i'm like um girl i've oh, talked to you yeah. for since when i've been knowing you since september like what's going on just tell me so i knew with her how nervous she was when she called me i was like damn it they denied me i was like oh and then she said, uh, "We well, we didn't deny you, but uh, she's like, no, the, the transplant team it thinks that it's um, the committee thinks it's a uh, we we they decided they wanted to defer you. They didn't deny you, nor they didn't accept you, but you know, right now you're deferred. And I already knew what deferred means. They put me on hold, and I'm like, damn it. And oh, I asked man. her, okay, what's up? What well, what's the reason? And I actually posted on my Instagram page." um a further detail about why they deferred me and it's more than one reason um so that's the video i saw yeah yeah and i think uh let me see what, exactly what it was because i have so much going on i just don't even remember anymore and i have to write it down it's okay um, um i wanted to ask you a couple questions after yeah you, you of course in. hold you, on let me see go ahead look yeah. for it and i'll ask you a couple questions i have a yeah huh uh okay there it goes okay so they said that i needed to um they were gonna check on me again in six weeks to like mm -hmm. do more blood work and make sure i'm getting weight so they said the, the main thing it's because i'm still a little too skinny so i was like 106 mm -hmm. and then i think whenever i started transplant i was at 103 and i just gained like three pounds in like a few months so they still want me to gain weight and i think they want me to be around 110 115 if i can get a little bit you know chunkier then it's better um right now i'm at 109 which is good i'm gonna okay, so continue to gain weight so i'm like i'm like that's a piece of cake cool that's fine and then she also said that my ck levels were a little high um they've been high since i've been diagnosed with the m they've and always been high so they're called creatine kinase levels and i don't know much science behind it but i know that if you have high ck levels it's pretty much like your body's in pain you have a lot of inflammation oh. weakness like there was times that i couldn't even pick up a glass of water without holding my my arm with my other mm -hmm. hand and picking it up like this like it was so painful um i was very weak i couldn't even pick up a glass of water imagine that so my ck Man. levels have always been pretty high but lately, I think I'm at my lowest. I believe I'm at 200 and something. And they want me to stay around there and hopefully go into the green range, which is below 190. So um, 
we're in a good path right now with that. You know, I think I was, my highest was always like 5,000 ish. So to be at 200 right now and then 5,000 from last year, I think I've done a lot of progress. Um, but they don't want me to flare up. They don't want me to be in a flare while receiving a transplant because it can be crucial with the lungs. And then they also said that they were going to refer me to a psychiatrist. So I was like, wow. Um, you know, whenever people hear the word psychiatrist, they, it's like, um, I don't know why they just, pe- there's a lot of common misconceptions with that. Yeah. But I think they want me to go to psych because, uh, I have a lot going on with all this bad news that's been given to me since like mm-hmm. for a while. They just want to make sure I'm okay. They don't want to um, make yeah. sure you don't want to, they don't, you don't harm no, yeah. yourself. Yeah. Oh, and on top of that, like they think, uh, I have a lot of anxiety now. I've developed a little bit of anxiety with, with specific tests and, um, mm-hmm. they just want to make sure I'm good and they want to make sure that I'm not depressed and stuff like that. And just taking care of my mental health. So I'm like, okay, that's fine. Like take me to psych. That's fine. So I think I have an appointment with him next month. And then also, um, they're talking to my rheumatologist regarding that rituxan medication that I spoke about earlier the one that's been helping me with my dermatomyositis. Mm -hmm. And I actually got word today from my rheumatologist um, and my pulmonologist. And they said that they were going to take me off Rituxan, which I'm a little sad about, but I mean, if it's, it's going to help me to get on that list and I'm going to do it. Um, I think they're going to switch me from Rituxan to something else called Tacro. Um, I believe it's called Tacro. I'm not sure, but it's going to help with the, with also um, with the inflammation and everything. And it's, it's a more accepting medication pre and post transplant, because I don't know why I, I think I've read something about like um, rituxan is not a good medication to be on post transplant. I believe it brings up your antibodies or, or like it brings up your, your immune system. And what they want to do is they want to suppress it. So my body cannot attack the lungs. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's another thing. And I think my rheumatologist and my pulmonologist have been doing pretty good with getting that fixed. Um, they also want to, um, check my pH impedance, uh, test again. They want to review it. I think they want me to do it again. I'm not sure, but they want to mm-hmm. review it. They also want to check into my HLA uh, lab, uh, levels. I think it's had my antibodies. So, okay. My antibodies are pretty high um, and they're at 72%. So what that means is that I am uh, the donors in the nation. Since my, my antibodies are 72%, I can only be a pretty good match for 28% of the donors in the nation, meaning one out of four lungs are a perfect match to me. And that's not including wow. the size of the lungs. If we match through blood, if we, if our blood works, like if our blood mix is good, if the lungs are healthy at all, if, um, how far they are from where I'm at, like, it's a lot of other factors to make sure that I'm like a good candidate for those lungs. Mm -hmm. So my chances of being on that list are pretty, um, to be on that list for a long time is pretty high. And they want to see what's going to happen with, with that, with my antibodies. And the reason why I have these antibodies is because I've been pregnant before. So in my case, um, when we're, we're, you know, a woman develops antibodies through their pregnancies and I just happen to have a lot of antibodies through mine, which is, um, kind of working against me right now. Dang. So, yeah. That's so, uh, that's so unfortunate that something so beautiful yeah. can now cause you so much, so much more issues kind of just yeah. piling up even more. Right. Um, I wanted to ask you when it came to the food situation, you mentioned that because of your esophagus is the reason why you're not going to have a feeding tube. So yes. what if, so if you were to have a right, like a healthy esophagus, would, would food still be out of the option after your transplant or would, would, would they still consider the route of you still going to have a feeding tube, even if you had a regular swallowing uh, and a healthy um, esophagus? So whenever you have a good esophagus, well, so what you're asking is if I had a good esophagus to begin with. Correct. Um, would, like would if I didn't have that. I mean, yeah. No. Would you still after the transplant be like, would the doctors be okay with you eating food? Okay. Okay. I yeah. see. So um, if I were not to have that stomach, that esophagus issue, 
I would still be on that feeding tube post surgery mm-hmm. for like three weeks or so. Like that's protocol with everyone because they want to make sure you do a swallow test before they take that tube out. And then also, um, they but also forever, said that right? no, not forever. Yeah. And but the thing is that food aspiration is still um, very risky with people, even if they have a good esophagus. Because wow. sometimes the food goes down the wrong pipe mm-hmm. and then, hey, I don't have uh, an immune system. I have to go to the freaking doctor and tell them that I choked on my food. You know, make sure those lungs are good and they're not causing early um, infection or whatever. So it's like, um, God, these lungs are going to be like taking care of a newborn for the rest of my life. Right. There's a lot yeah. of things that go into it that can cause infections. Is there a science that, or, or do you know, have the doctors give you an answer as to why when you get your, I don't, and I don't know this, I literally legitimately don't know, mm-hmm. like when you get your lungs removed, why is it that your immune system has gone with it or how to, okay. do you, have you looked into that or is that a, a too much of a deep question? Cause <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, okay. I, I, would, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I haven't done my research on it, but right. why would that be? So basically trans um so basically whenever you receive an organ from another person your body knows that it's it's a it's, it's not external. part of it yeah it's it's like a an intruder so naturally our bodies our our body is going to attack it and mm-hmm. kill it thinking it's something that's not meant to be in our body because it really isn't so what right. they do is that they put you on immunosuppressants for life in order to suppress your immune system so it won't oh, attack wow. the organ. And that's with any, I believe that's with any organ, even with liver transplants, um, which is pretty wow. much one of the most common and um, most transplanted organ. It's like a very common, um, you know, organ to donate. And uh Yeah. I think they that, also are on in his presence. That just caught me off guard. I would have never thought they would. That that yeah. makes so much sense, though. Yeah. Um, I have something called a links implant on in my body, and you know there there's like a possibility that your body could reject like an external object into your body. Mm. And now that you're telling me, when I was doing my research a little bit on that, it kind of makes you know a little bit more sense. Yeah, so, so that's pretty yeah. much what it is. Yeah. So. Yeah. Then now you're waiting for the lung. Um, you're wait. You're on the refer. What is that? The re- re- not refer. Deferred. List. Deferred list. So yeah. is so they would try to put you on the waiting list or what? What? How does that process work? Of okay, getting you know what I'm getting to the lung yeah. transplant how, to be listed. To be listed. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, is this? Compat- com- compatibility like I-, I don't know how that works and i'm assuming you've done some of your teachers now that uh that uh they've told you that so right that's one of the last things i want to get into so uh, w- you know we can kind of wrap this up okay so pretty much they're gonna want to see me in six weeks and they're gonna want to try and do more lab work to make sure that my ck levels are still low um mm-hmm. you know they're not like i'm not flaring up and you know, I hope I'm not, I feel good. And then also they want to do more. Um, they want to check my antibodies again to see where I'm at with that. And then they also want to make sure that everything else that they've come across, I think it's a specific word, it's called a, a barrier. So, which is like, um, the list that I mentioned earlier about what they want to make sure they want to look right. into, you know, everything that, that pretty much why they denied me or they put me on hold you know, those, those barriers need to be resolved, you know, that I've gained weight and then they will go through my case again and the transplant committee will speak. And then hopefully they will approve my case and then they take my, um, approval to my insurance. And then my insurance approves that they will be paying for the surgery. Um, but I believe that they just pay a specific amount because there's certain codes that they won't cover. And, um, you know, that's just a whole nother thing. And pretty much once my uh, insurance approves mm-hmm. of them being, you know, they're going to pay for the surgery. That's whenever they call me and they say, Hey, 
um, you've been approved, your insurance approved, you're active. And then that's whenever they act, they give me like a number and then they tell me what number I'm on, on the list. And then they, it's just a matter of waiting and I have to have my phone on. Um, I cannot put my phone on uh, silent anymore until, until I get that call. Um, they can call yeah. me at three in the morning and I have to be at the hospital. Yeah. They can call me at any time and I could be at the hospital. I have to be at the hospital as soon as they tell me, um, you know, so and also ready, it's ready. you got to go. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I just have to be ready to prepare myself and, and be ready to get that call. You know, I, I got to put my phone on speaker on loud. I'm sorry. Right. on loud. Right. Wow. Yeah. Oh man. That's a, that's a, what a process. What a process. And I'm glad that you mentioned, you know, the entrance and the coverages, because I do want to let the people know, uh, you know, if you guys are wondering on, you know, how to help uh, Miranda in any way, she does have a GoFundMe and she's almost reached her goal amount. So we if you want to help, if you want to, you know, just give back anything you can. Um, but if not, you know, a prayer, just thinking of her show her some love in the comment section. That would be great. But I will leave yeah. her GoFundMe link in uh, the description of this video so you guys can, you know, support, show some love, and, and you know, just uh, – and I know anything would help. Uh, she does have no, a goal yeah, amount, but even if – if and when she reaches that goal amount, you know, if you still feel like you need to, you know, keep, you know, donating or, 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 or show her love, keep Sharing doing that story. because – it's gonna be it's gonna be so expensive. I mean, just a lung transplant. I can't even imagine. Yeah, how, no. How expensive, and not just that, but the afterwards, right? The healing process. Yeah, you try course. to get back into your life, and who knows if you ever go back to the workforce or not. So, uh, yeah. So if you guys can, you know, if you guys can and are able to, uh, you know, feel free and just to donate. I'll put that in. Uh, I had to make sure that um, I didn't forget about that part because. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna reach the goal and we're gonna exceed it. Yeah, of course. No, thank you. Um, so I wanted to show uh the people some of your images that you've shared with yeah. me. Uh, and uh, so we can look at it together. Maybe you can, you know, just tell them a little bit about <laughs> when okay. they took place. Uh, yeah, I just think, I think it's very important because it shows um not just your vulnerability but like what your what your day-to-day -day life is you know like just uh how real it is and how you yeah. deal with things so i'm gonna share that with you guys in just a sec so you guys can see and um the, I, i'm i'm really i'm really excited of, of how you actually take this and you're just like i'm gonna own it you know? <laughs> yes that's all i can so, do this is you with uh <laughs> with the oxygen um my cylinder Dude. is that what it's called the cylinder <laughs> yeah yeah it's an uh hold on it's a oxygen cylinder it's the metal one it's like two feet tall ish wow yeah nice. i i oh man i just started using that too i think they they transitioned me into that in october of, of last year and you know the reason why i even went public with my story is because i was not going to be able to hide that big old metal thing <laughs> uh, from my family and friends i was like oh my gosh imagine me going to brunch with my friends and carrying this thing behind me like oh my gosh what happened to you like i knew you were sick but not that sick like what's going on yeah yeah, yeah. but you know i owned it i owned it i feel so comfortable and you know carrying that thing around i i don't yeah. care anymore what people think so yeah amen amen you want to you're gonna <laughs> touch and affect a lot of people um Oh this is you. I know. I know this. I know this <laughs> one. I, I've done yeah. this test before. This is the PFT, right? Yeah. Did you do the PFT test. Yeah. 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 It was. Yeah. So for anybody that's Hate those wondering, tests. Yeah. Yeah. No, They're the worst. Uh, I had it one time, and you know, hopefully, I don't have to do it again in a very long time. But imagine I me. I have to do those things every other month now. Ah. Uh, yeah. Oh, they they take a lot of energy out of me. So. If they yeah. took energy out of you doing it once, imagine someone like me with 20% lung capacity. Trying to blow and force it out right into that little Man. tube. It's so yeah. difficult. It, it is. It's, it's, it's a test that everyone hates. Like every time I go, I'm like, I hate doing this test. And they're like, you're not the first one nor the last patient that says that. Yeah. And you have to hold your breath, right? I remember now that you have to yeah. hold your breath. And you can't. You told me that you can't even hold, do that like for so long. No. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, that's crazy. 
this is another to me it's a a wow <laughs> image which is all, oh all your all your tanks that my lifeline <laughs> oh man i look yeah. at that and i'm just like wow that's uh yeah. that's wild are yeah, you that's... do you return these by the way or how does that do you, do you keep them okay. or are you keeping them just to What's no this? so these are ref so Refillable. basically my oxygen company I call them whenever I'm low. Like if I have like maybe when I'm like five, uh, when I have five left, I give them a call and then they schedule me. I have to call them like in a week in advance and then they schedule to give me another delivery. So they take the empty oh, ones and they bring me full, they bring me full ones. And I think right now I'm doing 30, 38 at a time. I should do a, a 40 maybe. But I, I that right there in that picture, it's a I think three weeks worth of supply, and that's that's because I don't really go out a lot anymore. But if I were to go out daily, like how I used to before I got very sick, that mm -hmm. would probably last me a week. So all of this will last you a week. Yeah, yeah. If I were wow. to go out like how I used to, yeah. So I, I, I try to preserve as much as I can because I don't like calling them. So I think I go like a full day of errands, let's say waking up at eight in the morning, going out to the doctor. By the time I come back, you know, driving or like getting driven because I don't drive anymore. And mm -hmm. then maybe going to the store to get some groceries or something. And I come back home around four or 5 p.m. I would go through maybe two and a half tanks. So three tanks in total for a full day of errands. Um, and I don't really go out late. a lot. <laughs> uh, I think. I don't even know. I think they may be like mm, five or eight pounds. I think wow. they're around there. Yeah. And I have a double, a, like a little double. Um, I don't know if you can see in the back on the left side, like that thing that, that I pull. I okay. have one that's double. Like you could put two tanks at a time. And that one oh, is heavy. That you. one is super heavy. But I don't bring that one out. I don't bring that double, uh, you know, tank thing out or the little okay. roller out all the time. I only take it out whenever like I have to go to like a, an event where I can't go to the car and switch them out. Like I went to a concert with my husband about two months ago and I used that double tank and it was a, it was a, people were looking at me very weird cause there was a bunch of youngsters there and I'm like, Oh it. man. Yeah. Uh, oh <laughs> man. So uh, this is you traveling. Yes. Uh, Mexico, I'm assuming. Right. Or was it? Yeah. Yeah. Mexico. Yeah. Uh, where is it? Uh, the pyramid of the sun. That was when I went to Mexico City. Okay, yeah. so the actual city. That looks like a yeah. beautiful pyramid, by the way. Yeah, it's very, very pretty. Uh, very big, too. Yeah, this is you owning it as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this, is, uh, this, gonna, this is you in the hospital. Yeah, that's whenever I did the right heart cap. That was the, that's what I was going to ask you. That's when you did yeah. the right heart. Oh, my god. They goodness. put that thing on my neck, and they said, do not get this off for a few hours, because if not, you'll bleed out. And I'm like, all right, thank you so much for the information. I was scared oh. of taking that thing off. Only, yeah. only the fact that it looks so small, and it's holding, like, so I guess the, the pressure of the blood back so, yeah. so much. That's... It was a tiny, I, I have a scar, actually. It was a tiny little hole, um, very, very tiny. I'm talking about like, I don't even know. It's it just very, very tiny little hole, um, but it hurt. It did hurt, and I couldn't really talk for a while. But yeah. Zoom into that. So they, it looks like just a, a big Band-Aid, but a special yeah. Band-Aid. It, it, it was a special Band-Aid. It had like um, something underneath so it won't cause like an infection. Like it looked like Vaseline or something. Oh, uh, okay. Got you. Got you. Got you. Got you. So we're going to move on and share. And this is the one we shared already with the, the yeah, garages, which you told me it got yeah. worse. And I, that already looks bad. <laughs> that yeah, already it looks, does. Yeah. That already looks bad. So, mm. um, and this is you owning it again. Yeah. Which I, I actually have so much respect for you because <laughs> it's, uh, it's something that you, you are embracing, you know? Mm. It's like you finally came to terms with it and now you're embracing it. And to be honest, it's it's very good for you, for other people that are suffering, not just from health issues, but even something some, similar to you, right? If they have right. PF, like they see, you know, the type of life you're living. And even though you are struggling and going through so much, 
you're still just out here, you know, just being yeah. you. And uh, I think that's that's a beautiful thing. So thank you uh, for the people for the people that are watching. Uh, I, I respect gotta stay that so positive. Much. Gotta stay positive. Gotta stay positive. And oh, this one I too, love that own picture. It, own, it, <laughs> I, own it again. You're yeah, owning that's it, such a good picture. You. I love that picture. You're owning, you're owning it. The hair, everything, nails. Thank you. Got, you. Uh, matching all of that yeah like and you that. know Look. there was a i think uh that was actually a gift for my community so the hair was actually done by this um well-known uh hairstylist in my city in dallas and the makeup also from like a pretty well-known mua wow. um in dallas and i i didn't even know they were gonna gift this to me like they gave me a, a photographer a friend uh, gifted me a photo shoot and hair and makeup you know it was all gifted because of i guess they were just were trying to do like family photos and that yeah. was like just the behind the scenes of what i wore yeah it you was a nice I gift thought, i thought that it was a great gift i thought you looked very professional in this one <laughs> yeah no yeah, yeah. and i don't that's get a... i don't get ready all the time but you know i, I felt good <laughs> no that's that's good that's uh <laughs> I, I respect that we might use use this as a thumbnail or something, you know, or the yeah. other ones for for the for the video. This is Whichever great, one. and I think, yeah, I think I think this and this we showed this one. By the way, you know, I've never been to the Grand Canyon, but I do want to go. Really, I do want to go. Yeah, I want to go one day. I can imagine it. Like, did you hike this to get up here, or did uh, you go like it, it was like, in the car? It was an easy flat hike. So okay. we drove as far as we could, and then we like walked and try to hike down a little bit into where like the you know how they have like those metal bars or whatever so you won't go over it so we yeah. we like went over a little bit and we hiked a little bit but it was tough it yeah. was tough and and oh my god the view and I, I don't really share much about my travel photos but i wish i i wish i would i wish i could have at the time but visiting the grand canyon was was just breathtaking very wow. very beautiful the views look awesome the views they look do. awesome. And <laughs> this one is a special one. I know you told Aww, me it has yeah. sentimental value to you. Yeah. So, uh, this is so, your talk to It was us. in Tell Mexico. Us. So this one right here, um, that was in Mexico City. And I was visiting that castle in Mexico City. I, I don't know the name of it, but it's like a very famous castle, like in the very top of the hill. Um, and so in Mexico... Um, they're not very accommodating with people that need like uh, special needs, I guess, unless mm. you have proof, like they have like, you need like some kind of ID. But since I'm technically a foreigner, I don't have that kind of ID other than my handicap pass. Right. And then um, they didn't want to give me a wheelchair. So I had to walk up that castle and it goes like this around and around until you reach the top oh. of the castle. And it's like, it's elevating. So it goes up and I, I can, I kid you not. I was, resting like every 10 seconds because i couldn't go up and then the elevation of mexico city itself it's, it's so high i think it's like seven thousand feet above sea level so that i air think I'm not, I'm not sure yeah so i was already like choking you know with the with oxygen with the oxygen tank that i was i was using at the time and you know going up there i was like basically like getting very lightheaded so what I what my mom did was that she told me to sit down on one of those benches and then my brother went up all the way up, asked for a wheelchair. They did not want to give it to him. And he said, My sister needs a wheelchair. She uses oxygen. She cannot keep going up. She's gonna faint. So then they gave it to her, to him, I'm sorry. And then he came back and put me on that wheelchair. Oops, sorry. And then they um <laughs> he like pulled me all the way up. And people were looking at me very weird because I mean, look at me, like I'm young. I don't look yeah. sick. And why are they pulling like a young girl uh, in a wheelchair? The gaslighting. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. But, yeah. <sighs> I use wheelchairs awesome. now. <laughs> I use wheelchairs now whenever I can. Because I think walking, it's gotten so difficult now that they help, you know, whenever I, I have, I, I'm able to use them. I, I take advantage and use them for now. Because I won't yeah. be able to do that once I get those new lungs. I want to work and work out work them out as much as i can you want to work them lungs i i yeah, respect that sure. yeah yeah plus let people push you you know let the mm -hmm. let others do a little work for you <laughs> that's a and i think that's and this is you at the hospital yeah that was at the er that was my last er visit 
when I, <laughs> it was a, uh, the day after Christmas, December 26th of this year, actually, um, I went to the ER with like bad pain right here on my right side. And I thought it was my, um, what's that word called? I thought it was my gallbladder, but it ended up being my right kidney. And they told me that I had a uh, hydronephrosis, which is basically um, some kind of kidney infection. And I had to like, my body just had to uh, clean it out. And I started taking like, uh, they gave me antibiotics, but it didn't help. So I wasn't paying for like three weeks after that, um, after that uh, visit. And I started drinking something called Palo Azul which is like a herb. Okay. I don't know if you ever heard of it. It's like, never, um, heard, of it. never heard of it. It's really good for uh, kidney cleansing. And it's like a basically like a little stick and you put it in your water and then like um, let it dilute in the water. And then whenever it takes everything out of that stick, the water turns blue. It's so cool. Like it's like a yellowish and bluish. You need to look that up. It's really, really cool. And um, it helped. It helped a lot with the with the kidney pain, and it it went away. So three weeks in pain with kidney issues oh, because man. I don't drink uh, a lot of water. So uh, yeah, just another thing. <laughs> One thing after another. You with your daughter, so yeah, my nah, baby. That that's beautiful. Um. Oh man, uh, this is. I feel like I've been in a wild ride right now. I'm not gonna lie to you. This is um. A lot. This, yeah, this it, it is a lot. I can I can only imagine what you've been through, and I know we all have like our, our certain stories uh, that we talk about. So, oh, by the way, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I did mm -hmm. a little research. Okay. Of what's the color of like, um, uh, pulmonary uh, fibrosis? And I saw that a lot of a lot of purple was related. To PF, so okay. that's why the background, the background of our video is purple. Nice. So I, was, I was doing my research yesterday, and I was like, "What color is it that's related to PF?" And I was like, "I gotta find it." And a lot of colors that showed was uh, was I uh, was just purple. A lot of, I saw a lot of purple. There's different colors. Really? Huh. Purple, purple was the most common one I saw. So okay. maybe it's wrong, but I thought it was. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was cool. I know for Gerd is green. So right. I know that one for me, but you know, for this one, uh, I, I saw a lot of online uh, purple. people using purple, the color purple, and I thought it was, I thought it was cool. So I figured I would use it here. I don't know I if think... there's any colors you can tell us though. Yeah. So I, well, that I know of, I think purple is also a color, but from what I've known, it's teal and green, like a light green. What and I actually have a tattoo. That? Teal oh, is like a like a bluish color. Oh, okay. Yeah, like a like a soft bluish. So, I actually got a tattoo of like lungs on my right arm, right right arm, and then half of that. the lungs is like flowers and I put teal and blue because I I thought that that's what the colors are to represent PF. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I guess well, I'm right. purple. No, 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 wait. I hope you're right then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I hope you're right. Uh, but I, I guess if not, Google failed me because I went to Google and that's the color, the co color that I most commonly saw. But you know what? Regardless, even if I'm wrong, I'm going to go get, you know, purple on top of this. I think you're right. I think you might be right. But <laughs> I looked at it and it said per like most of them are purple. And I was like, all right, that's cool. Because I know crazy. purple is also for UC, uh, also, re also, also rate of colitis. Okay. Because uh, I had a friend that had suffered from that, too. So. Oh, wow. Um. Yeah. Okay. So, hey, Miranda, I want to just uh thank you for coming into my channel. Um, again, I want to thank you for sharing your story with me. When I again, when I saw your video of your update, uh, and I didn't tell these people earlier, but I legitimately, I cried oh. when I saw you just <laughs> talking about your issues and your health. And like I was telling you before, you know, I know that I'm suffering from a lot of issues and it feels right. like sometimes going to be the end of me. But when I saw your video, man, it was just so touching because typically I'm on, I'm on the side that you are on where it comes to me telling people what's going on with my life, yeah. how much of a struggle things are, 
and I'm the one sharing, you know, my my struggles for positivity through my YouTube channel and through uh, the people that come across my YouTube channel or my story in general, right? The people that get to meet me. But you're one of the few people that we kind of flip size, even though I am sick and even though I'm suffering from a lot of different issues, you know, your issue is just, it's a lot. And it just made me appreciate <laughs> yeah. life. And, you know, I had to ask God for forgiveness for sometimes, you know, wanting to be even healthier, wanting to be even more. But sometimes we forget that it can be worse. Right. right and yeah. Safe, unfortunately, it is. And, um, you know, I just want to say that myself and my community, uh, we're out here uh, to support you uh, in the best we can. By the way, guys, Miranda's starting her YouTube channel. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, plug that in. I was convinced. I was convinced uh, to I, I start it. In. Your story is very <laughs> Oh, I'm telling you, your story is Thank very beautiful, and I know it's going to touch a lot of people, and I'm speaking that on you. So um, I know it will, and I'm going to plug in your YouTube channel for the people that want to subscribe. I'm going to promote. I'm going to use that also on my Instagram and everything else. Uh, and again, just thank you so much for sharing your, your story, your journey. No, of course. Uh, thank you. You're such a strong person, and uh, I really appreciate you. you. I'm I told you, I'm having this procedure I've told my YouTube channel about before. I'm going to endoscopy and I'm going to have you in the back of my mind just thinking how strong you are because I need to be strong to all these anxiety attacks I get before like light procedures. Or anything no, else. of course. Yeah. No, yeah. And, and, and you know, um, you know, when you say that, you know, your story, my story was touching to you, that that's pretty much my goal to reach to people that need to hear my story. For whatever reason, if it's like um, inspiration or motivation, um, uh, you know, a glimpse of hope or whatever it is, or yeah. to spread awareness, that is pretty much my main reason why I I decided to go public with this. Other than because I couldn't hide, you know, my oxygen anymore in public, but that's another that's another reason. But you know, um, I'm actually very glad that you that you mentioned that because that means I'm doing something right. And I hope yeah. that, you know, with this video that we're doing and with, with me being more open and public and very more comfortable sharing my story and my struggles and whatever I'm going to go through in the future once I get this transplant, um, I hope it educates people and it, and it brings awareness to, you know, being a transplant recipient is not that easy. It's not just, you know, um, it's not a cure. It's actually... Um, they tell me this, they tell me that's not a cure. It's, it's, it's an exchange for one disease, t uh, for another list of, um, medical issues in the future. And, you know, if I'm willing to do this, you know, it's, it's going to be very educational for other people that want to pursue this in the near future, right. if they have some kind of same medical issues. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, no, um, you know, I hope that it, it reaches the right crowd and it reaches the right people that yeah. I want to spread awareness and, you know, just right. some kind of hope. And I, I'm glad you mentioned hope. And, and to end it with that, I'm glad you mentioned hope because I think when it comes to, you know, a lot of health issues, it, it doesn't matter how big or small they are to you. Uh, hope is something that I feel like a person is the last thing they should lose because once you lose hope, you know, I, I feel like that's when, you know, I feel like everything ends for you. But as long as you have that glimpse of hope, and maybe somebody else is struggling uh, as young as you are uh, with with PF, you know, maybe you will touch them to to keep fighting. Right. Yeah. Just like in some type of way you touch me that, you know, that from that video that night to to keep going and just, you know, keep fighting. You're going to continue doing that. And I, I really believe that. So God bless you for that. And uh, thank you for coming thank on you. my channel. If you guys have any questions for Miranda, like after you watch this video, or along, you know, throughout the journey of, of her life, I'm going to put her social media on the description of, of the YouTube um, section. But if mm -hmm. you have any questions, you know, feel free to write them down. She can either respond that, you know, in the YouTube section. Or if not, we can create another video just on whatever questions that they have. Yeah, no, yeah, of but, course. Um, I, I really appreciate you being here. And I, I know you're going to touch a lot of people. So. Thank uh, you. Continue your journey. God bless you. God bless you guys. Thank, Thank you guys you. for watching. Don't forget. Don't forget to like, subscribe to the YouTube channel. We keep growing, Familia. Uh, it's a uh, it's a beautiful thing. Hopefully, you guys are enjoying uh, this content and just um, you know, there's a lot of people going through the same thing. So as I always say and I always mention, don't forget that you're not alone. 
Um, mm-hmm. So don't feel alone. There's all you know. There's all a lot of people out there that are are, su- are suffering just like you are. And um, yeah, you're going strong. God bless you guys. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for supporting. And I'll see you guys on the next video. Peace and love, familia. Deuce. Bye.